Camp David, the president and his inner circle discussing how to advance their agenda and map out their strategy for the midterms later this year. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new hour inside America's newsroom. I hope you're warm and indoors right now. I'm <laughs> that would be the operative word, warm <laughs> and indoors. Two words there. And I'm Kelly Wright. Thanks for joining us again. President Trump also doubling down on his criticism of a White House tell-all book describing fire and fury as mere fiction. The president saying his qualifications for office speak for themselves. I went to uh, the best colleges or college. Uh, I went to a, uh, I had a situation where I was a very excellent student, came out, made billions and billions of dollars, became one of the top business people, went to television and for 10 years was a tremendous success, as you probably have heard. Uh, ran for president one time and won. Rich Edson is live at the White House with more. Rich. Hey, good afternoon, Julie. And this type of criticism is how the day began at Camp David on Twitter from the president. He's responding to this book that claims uh, that uh, the president and everyone surrounding the president believes that uh, he is unfit for office. So the president waking up this morning at Camp David tweeting, quote, actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being like really smart. Crooked Hillary Clinton also played these cards very hard and, as everyone knows, went down in flames. I went Went from very successful businessman. We're having some audio issues with Rich Edson. We'll try to get him back later in the show. Kelly. All right. The Russian investigation back in the spotlight this Saturday. Two top Senate Republicans now urging the Justice Department to launch a criminal investigation into Christopher Steele. He was the major figure behind that Trump dossier containing salacious and unverified allegations. Senator Lindsey Graham releasing a statement saying this, quote, after reviewing how Mr. Steele conducted himself in distributing information contained in the dossier and how many stop signs the DOJ ignored in its use of the dossier, I believe that a special counsel needs to review this matter. The rule of law depends on the government and all who work on its behalf playing by the rules themselves. Caroline Shively's been following the story and she joins us live now from our Washington Bureau with more details. Caroline? Hi there, Kelly. Senator Graham and the Republican head of the Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, think Steele may have lied to federal investigators about his contact with reporters over that Trump dossier. Steele is a former British spy who was on the payroll of opposition research firm Fusion GPS. The project was later partially funded by the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign. Graham and Grassley laid out their suspicions about Steele in a letter to the Justice Department. Members of Congress can't levy criminal charges, but they can flag them to the DOJ for more review. This is the first known criminal referral from Congress as part of the Russia investigation. The veracity of the contents of the dossier is still disputed. The criminal referral makes no judgment on that. But many Republicans want to know if the dossier sparked the FBI investigation into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. But this all goes to how did this be a priority? Kelly? Indeed, Caroline Shively reporting from Washington. Thanks, Caroline. You bet. All right, we fixed the hiccup. Let's get back to Rich Edson live at the White House with more on the president's latest tweet, uh, basically today defending himself uh, regarding those who are questioning his mental stability. Rich, That's go right. ahead. Yeah, Julie, uh, I imagine something uh, with the cold created a problem there. But uh, the president this morning began the day defending his mental capabilities. This is all because of Michael Wolff's book, in which in that book and in subsequent interviews, he has claimed that those surrounding the president believe that he is unfit for office, questioning his intelligence. Well, the president took to Twitter from Camp David this morning, tweeted, quote, actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being like really smart. Crooked Hillary Clinton also played these cards very hard and, as everyone knows, went down in flames. I went from very successful businessman to top TV star to president of the United States on my first try. I think that would qualify as not smart, but genius and a very stable genius at that president 
fielded a few questions after this cabinet meeting at Camp David with a number of congressional Republican leaders there as well. One of the issues that came up is a response to the reporting that the president and uh, staffers in the White House pushed Attorney General Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself from the Russia investigation. The president responded to those reports. The story, by the way, in the Times was way off, or at least off. Uh, but everything that I've done is 100% proper. That's what I do is I do things proper. And, you know, I guess the collusion now is dead because everyone found that after a year of study, there's been absolutely no collusion. The president offer, also offered a discussion on... Uh, on immigration, saying that he would extend the DACA program, where Republicans would be for those protections, but he wants to get rid of chain migration, the, uh, the visa lottery system, and he wants additional money for border security. Julie Kelly, back to you. All right, Rich Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the Justice Department and the FBI officially launching an investigation into the Clinton Foundation over allegations of pay to play. The investigation putting Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State under the microscope yet again. Here's President Trump reacting earlier. Now, there has been collusion between Hillary Clinton and the DNC and the Russians. Unfortunately, you people don't cover that very much. But the only collusion is between Hillary and the Russians and the DNC and the Russians. Let's bring in Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary and Fox News contributor. Thank you, Ari, for talking to us. Glad to be here. Um, so sources close to the investigation are telling Fox that investigators have actually, and this has been going on for months now, even though we're just learning about it, already have conducted multiple interviews associated with the probe, which includes looking into whether the Clinton Foundation violated tax law by promising favors in exchange for donations or pledges of cash or gifts. What happens if investigators find evidence of pay to play? Well, the investigators find evidence. They'll take it to the Department of Justice and see if it's anything that Justice Department prosecutors feel needs to be prosecuted. It's very serious. Uh, and it should be fact-based. It should not have anything to do with anybody's politics. It should be determined by the findings of the FBI as they investigate. Okay. The uh, spokesperson for Hillary Clinton and the foundation, Nick Merrill, uh, tells Fox that the investigation is just an attempt by the Trump administration to distract the public. I want your reaction to what they're calling it. Let me put that up on the screen. Let's call this what it is, a sham. And then he goes on to say it began with a long debunked project spearheaded by Steve Bannon during the presidential campaign. It continues with Jeff Sessions doing Trump's bidding by heeding his calls to meddle with a department that is supposed to function independently. The goal is to distract from the indictments, guilty pleas, and accusations of treason from Trump's own people at the expense of our justice system's integrity. It's disgraceful and should be concerning to all Americans. And that is an end quote. It goes on. That was just a portion of it. What is the Clinton administration, what, what is the Clinton Foundation trying to do here? Well, it's such a flawed deflection from why this is being investigated. And actually, it's already been publicly reported. This investigation began during the Obama administration. The FBI, when President Obama was in office, had reason to believe that there may have been pay for play at the Clinton Foundation. They, FBI agents then, started to investigate it close to the election. The Obama Justice Department instructed the FBI to keep investigating but not issue any subpoenas, not to go forward with anything more than just to look into things. And it basically put it on hold. And then the FBI continued to look. They just didn't issue subpoenas. But the investigation never stopped. So what we've only learned this week is that the investigation has gotten more active again. So this investigation is not a sham. It's a leftover, a leftover from the Obama years. And now the FBI seems to have found something that's kicked it into a higher gear. Why do you believe it's become more active recently, as you mentioned? Well, there's only one reason the FBI makes something more active, and that's because they found something new. 
when the FBI has just got something on hold, it's really because there's just not sufficient information there for them to either close it or to continue to go forward, at least that anybody publicly learns about. When there is something that all of a sudden they find a new witness, a new piece of paper, a new fact, that's what gets the FBI then to launch additional inquiries, talk to people, and that's typically how things leak. That's why these things get out to the public realm. They talk to a witness, the witness told somebody, somebody heard. Okay. Um, the FBI's uh, whole role in all of this is, is something that, uh, you know, you, it's hard to, there is just so many, you know, I guess, places in this investigation where one must wonder if the FBI is, is, is in a difficult place um, politically because the investigation is being led by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI in Little Rock, Arkansas. But sources are actually telling Fox that the FBI is mainly heading up this investigation. So you wonder what is the FBI's role in this in the midst of Robert Mueller's investigation of the Trump campaign and its ties to Russia? Well, I think you have to separate this from anything involving Bob Mueller and issues involving Russia. That's a special counsel. It operates to the side of the FBI. In this instance, what you have is typical business as usual. The FBI, the investigators, look for clues if they find something wrong. If they find a clue, then they have to go to prosecutors, and that's the U.S. Attorney's Office. The two work hand in hand. They always do, they always have, they always will. That's how our Justice Department is supposed to work, with no politicization. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you have to separate from is the Comey investigation into Hillary and her email, and then the Mueller investigation into Trump and Russia. This is totally a separate and independent trend brought up through career investigators at the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And again, it started under the Obama administration. This is not because Donald Trump said anything to the Justice Department and the Justice Department is reacting to Donald Trump. This began when President Obama was president. And as anybody who's followed the Clinton Foundation knows, that's no surprise. Allegations of pay for play have been in all the newspapers. It appears that they found something, something at least worth looking into. All right. Ari Fleischer, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder thank out you. there, be sure to check out Ari tomorrow night on the Fox News special, The Wise Guys. He will discuss the major issues affecting our country, along with Bill Bennett, Steve Wynn, Oliver North, and Alan Dershowitz. That is tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Fox. Bone chilling temperatures and dangerous wind chills are gripping much of the Northeast. The current temperature in Boston, about 10 degrees, and in Buffalo, New York, just 3 degrees. Brian Yennis is outside braving the elements for us right now. Brian, whew, hey. it looks cold yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah, Kelly, it is. This Arctic blast coming also right after the so-called bomb cyclone, which brought tremendous snow totals here in the Northeast and obviously brought snow even down to Tallahassee. So obviously the, after these storms, usually we can expect some 30 degrees, but no, we're talking about a wind chill advisory that is now in effect for the Northeast and for much of the Great Lakes region. Take a look at these wind chills right now. It is minus 20 in Watertown, New York. That's upstate New York, negative seven in Boston with the wind chill, negative nine in Pittsburgh with the wind chill. And, and as opposed for tomorrow morning, these are real time temperatures. The real temperature tomorrow morning is set to be negative four in Boston and that could break the January 7 record the daily record that was set in back in 1896 for the city of Boston and it was negative two then it'll be two degrees tomorrow morning here in New York and it'll be 22 degrees down in Atlanta so far reaching wind chills in Massachusetts by the way in the New England area expected to be negative 25 to negative 40 in some parts in the suburbs that's cold enough to cause frostbite in as little as 10 minutes and meanwhile we're talking about chaos right now at JFK Airport all morning long people talking about having to wait four five six even 20 hours on the tarmac in their planes without water without food and some some cases without toilets the port authority here in new york is actually now helping and coordinating with the faa to get people off of those planes with portable uh, staircases they're also busing them to their terminals take a look at this tweet right now this is from one passenger who tweeted k 
chaos at JFK, had to wait six hours post landing to be able to exit the plane, and now have been waiting for baggages for three hours, and it told it might take another four to come, left home in Paris 24 hours ago. So they are now working with the FAA to regulate and to limit how many planes are arriving at JFK. We'll have more word on that, but those could obviously have some effects on travel here this weekend. And over, let's look at this video. This is, um, this is amazing. Mount Washington, New Hampshire. This is from the Mount Washington Observatory at the top, at the summit there. It's so cold, they were blowing bubbles and they froze. And you can see the guy actually holding those bubbles as if it was a baseball. It feels like minus 100 in Mount Washington, New Hampshire. Over the last couple of days, it reached that real feel of minus 100. Just incredible temperatures, tied for the second coldest place here on Earth, here in the United States. Uh, incredible temperatures right now. Stay warm and stay safe. At least 22 people have died over the last week because of these cold temperatures. So last two weeks, actually. Mm. Kelly. You know, I'm looking at you. And I don't want to hold you, but you're standing out there. I see people walking behind you. Uh, people in New York are very stout. <laughs> they're hardy <laughs> people. They're, they're yeah. braving those temperatures as yourself. Personal question. What's it feel like for you personally? <laughs> you know what? Uh, I was in Boston for three or four days there, and that was pretty much the coldest. And, and actually, New Year's Eve night was pretty bad. I lucked out this time because I can actually run into a building this time. It's pretty right. bad out here. More than 10 minutes out here is not fun. And here in New York, people have no choice. They don't have cars. Yeah. So either you bought a ticket to come here to visit New York, so you got to go visit the tourist destinations, or you live here and you got to watch your train anyway. So, so brave you have no cold. choice. Layer up. Yep, yeah. Freezing cold. Yeah, make Stinging. sure you layer up. All right, yep. Brian, thank you. Of course. So the world of entertainment is in mourning. Uh, they are mourning the death of Jerry Van Dyke. We are going to take a look back at his life and memorable roles coming up next. Plus, could tensions be easing with North Korea? The rogue regime agreeing to talks with the South for the first time in two years. So is this real this time or is it an olive branch? We'll find out or just a ruse. He knows I'm not messing around. I'm not messing around. Not even a little bit. Not even 1%. If something can happen and something can come out of those talks, that would be a great thing for all of humanity. The man perhaps best known for his role on the 90s sitcom Coach has died. Jerry Van Dyke, the younger brother of Dick Van Dyke, died yesterday at his home in Arkansas. Jerry Van Dyke earned four Emmy nominations for playing the bumbling assistant coach Luther Van Dam on Coach, uh, a great show. One of his first TV roles was back in 1962 on his brother's The Dick Van Dyke Show. A very talented pair. A more and more recently, he appeared on ABC's The Middle. Van Dyke's wife tells TMZ she and her husband were in a car accident just two years ago, and his health had been deteriorating since then. Jerry Van Dyke was 86 years old. North Korea agreeing to hold official talks with the South next week. The high-level contact will take place in the demilitarized zone and comes after the U.S. and South Korea postponed their joint military exercises until after the Winter Olympics next month. President Trump saying his tough talk is a factor in this possible easing of tensions. I hope it works out. I very much want to see it work out between the two countries. I'd like to see them getting involved in the Olympics and maybe things go from there. Uh, so I'm behind that 100 percent. He actually thanked me. He said and a lot of people have said, a lot of people have written that without my rhetoric and without my tough stance, and it's not just a stance, I mean, this is, this is what has to be done. Joining me now, Dr. Ariel Cohen, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Council. Uh, thanks for joining us today, sir. Tell me, on the surface, what do you anticipate could take place with this meeting between the North and South? The position of the South Korean presidency is appeasing towards North Korea. It is one of the weaker administrations in the history of South Korea. So they want to talk to the North. They consider them brothers, which they are, of course. They're divided families and whatnot. But in the long term, it is the North that wants to squeeze the South and get as much as possible from that relationship, including money, including stuff, including the survival of uh, their regime. 
it's all about regime survival. I thought long and hard about what, the, what is a game that the Kim dynasty is playing. And the, it's a game of keeping their regime intact and possibly trying to unite all of the Korea under mm -hmm. the aegis of the North. And of course, as long as we keep our forces in the South, we, this is not going to happen. And also, if for some reason we demonstrate weakness and the South goes for nuclear deterrent, then there'll be a nuclear stalemate in the long run. Let me ask you the this then. The uh, what, what impact do you believe the Trump administration has uh, on these talks and what personal impact from the President of the United States in describing the situation with tough rhetoric and saying he's going to be firm? Uh, it's very uh, appropriate uh, for Kim Jong-un to know that U.S. is tough. The question is how you communicate that. Do you communicate it by your military posture, by deployment of additional uh, weapon system in the South, or by the incendiary rhetoric in your tweets? And I, I say it's the former. It's your stance. So I want to get back to this question, though, the, the actual meeting, because ostensibly they're meeting to discuss the Olympics and the fact that Kim Jong-un would like to see or at least put his teams, his athletes into the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, which would take place uh, next month. Having said that, uh, President Trump was asked that specific question today and if he had hoped it might go into something better than just talking about the Olympics or more of a deeper dialogue on what these two countries can do to try to end the uh, the tensions that have been going on there since 1950. They've been technically at war with each other. And the president is saying he would love to see that. He would welcome that. And then there's Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who says that the tough sanctions are in fact working and forcing North Korea to the table to talk to South Korea. What do you say? Uh, as I said, uh, North Korea wants to squeeze South Korea to give them money, to give them investment, to give them anything food for example they don't produce enough food because it's a communist system and it's extremely inefficient but in the long term i do not believe that that regime voluntarily is going to give up their nukes and if the united states and south korea are willing to sit down and uh, the united states wants to have a relationship and finish the state of uh, war okay. that they have since 1950 uh, with North Korea retaining the nukes, it'll be up to our administration. I think it's a very dangerous regime. It's bad for its own people, and it's very bad for the region. We will wait and see what develops when they start these, this dialogue between the two countries, and we'll also wait to see what China does. And, of course, we seem to understand right now what the United States is going to do, and that's continue to be tough. Dr. Ariel Cohen, thank you, sir. Thank you. So the U.S. is doubling down on its support of the Iranian people as they continue to protest against the government. So what is the next step? We're going to discuss straight ahead. Plus, the Trump administration giving new details on the border wall with Mexico. We'll have details next. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. Very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. In addition to that, we want some money for funding. We all want DACA to happen, but we also want great security for our country. So President Trump demanding funding for his proposed border wall and calling on Congress to set aside $18 billion over the next 10 years for the barrier in exchange for a deal to protect so-called dreamers. Garrett Tenney has been following this story and has more from Washington. This plan is the first detailed blueprint we have of the Trump administration's vision for a wall along the U.S.'s southern border, and it calls for a major expansion of border security. The Wall Street Journal viewed a copy of the document, which was shared with a number of senators on Friday, and reports the first phase of the plan would cost $18 billion, take 10 years to complete, and include more than 700 miles of new and replacement barriers along the southern border. The document also reportedly lays out the changes to immigration policy that President Trump has demanded to be included in any deal to address DACA and allow the Dreamers to remain in the country. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. 
very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. In addition to that, we want some money for funding. We need some additional border security. These are great people, and we need some border security. We need ICE. But we want to make sure that in terms of uh, what we want, and we, we want DACA to happen. Democrats are slamming the administration's plan for a border wall, including Senator Dick Durbin, who said the president may be pushing Congress towards a government shutdown with this latest proposal, adding it's outrageous that the White House would undercut months of bipartisan efforts by again trying to put its entire wish list of hardline anti-immigrant bills, plus an additional $18 billion in wall funding on the backs of these young people. Several items that were notably not included in the administration's plans are what kinds of barriers or walls will be used, where along the border this initial phase will be built, and how the White House plans to make Mexico pay for it. Kelly? Garretani, thank you. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, top Senate Democrats are working hard to hammer out a deal to protect hundreds of thousands of those so-called dreamers brought here illegally as children. But they warn President Trump's demands on immigration could lead to a government shutdown. So is there any room for compromise? Joining us now, Ali Stuckey, host of The Conservative Millennial on Conservative Review TV, and Ben Kissel, host of The Last Podcast on the Left. Thank you both for talking to us. Uh, okay, so Ben, top Democrats are saying that Trump's immigration demands could lead to a government shutdown. Uh, nobody wants that. So where is there room for compromise when it comes to immigration? There is a lot of room for compromise when it comes to immigration on the issues of chain migration and doing away with the lottery uh, uh, immigration process that we have now and going towards more of a merit-based approach. There you have a much, uh, a lot of compromise uh, and a lot of agreement amongst the Republicans and the Democrats. This poison pill of $18 billion for a border wall is really what is um, holding the entire bill hostage. And it's unfortunate because we're playing with the lives of 800,000 people, DACA recipients who did everything right, came to this country the proper way, and they don't deserve to be political ping pongs in this uh, in this ridiculous match. Okay, but Ali, I mean, where do Democrats stand on protecting our borders? I mean, how far away are they from meeting Republicans in the middle to end chain migration, end the visa lottery, uh, and toughen border security? Security. Right. I agree with some of what Ben said, and I hope that I'm not oversimplifying things here to say that we should be close to a compromise. I think Republican demands are not absurd in the slightest. They want to end chain migration, like Ben said. They want to end this visa lottery program. They also want to tighten border security, possibly via wall. And many Republicans have said in exchange for all of those things, they might even extend the DACA program by three years so these dreamers can apply for citizenship legally. If anyone is obstructing this process, if anyone is standing in the way of compromise, it is Democrats no. who are putting on the table that they want immediate citizenship for these dreamers who, by the way, I, I heard Ben say that they came here the right way. They did it. They're still illegal immigrants, so they have no. to apply for citizenship. They should not get immediate amnesty. Um, so it's the Democrats that are obstructing this process. And like I said, I think that's fine. Those are Democratic priorities. They, won't, they don't right. want to crack down on sanctuary cities. They don't want to tighten border security. But they need to be honest about the fact that they are the ones obstructing compromise. They are the ones that are going to be liable if the government does shut down. I don't know if anybody wants to automatically deal. grant them amnesty, no, but no Senators is. Chuck Grassley and John Cornyn, they're proposing to extend DACA for a few years so dreamers can apply for citizenship. Republicans aren't going to go for that. Uh, ben, how do, you, how, do you, how do you tackle this when you're talking about tens of millions of these dreamers, well, um, and do they deserve to have more time to apply for citizenship? Absolutely they do. Once again, they have to have an education, they have to have a job. There is a massive vetting process in order to qualify for DACA. Let's think rationally about this. We have an attorney general, Jeff Sessions, who wants to end legal marijuana, which is an $8 billion industry, basically giving $8 billion back to the drug cartels. And now we have a president who wants to add $18 billion for a border wall. It's counterintuitive. It's ridiculous. It's not rational. And it's Donald Trump just trying to throw some red meat to a base so he can hold on to a small amount of the constituency that he's been losing throughout the first year of his term. Allie? I agree with part of that. I think that we can probably agree on the marijuana part. The right and the left seem to be agreeing on that. And I mm -hmm. agree that $18.5 billion is absolutely insane. However, I think this is a lot more than red meat. Statistics show that Trump's base and a large portion of the American public really care about tightening border security. I mean, it affects our jobs. It affects our economy. It no. affects our safety. Um, this is not just trivial matters that we're talking about here. Securing our border, cracking down on Where sanctuary is... cities okay. are very important issues. Okay. 
Let's just get back to the wall, because that's an issue that really deeply divides Republicans and Democrats, is extending the wall with the border of Mexico, uh, namely because it's going to cost 18, 19 billion dollars. I, I don't know how much, which during More. the campaign, it promised that Mexico would pay for that. <laughs> right. And I mean, I don't make right. I don't mean to make light of this, but that is what the campaign was all about. Let's build that wall. Mexico's president's going right. to pay for it. Well, even during the campaign, the president of Mexico said, no, we're not. And he was right because now we need to cough up 19 billion dollars is there any way that democrats and republicans are ever going to come somewhere in the middle and meet in the middle ben when it comes to the wall there is a massive lie when it comes to immigration that they are uh, uh, illegal immigrants are flowing over our borders at, uh, from Mexico. We've stayed stagnant with roughly 11.5 million undocumented people, uh, undocumented individuals in this country for eight years. An 18 billion dollar wall is not intelligent. It is counterintuitive. It does nothing to solve the problem whatsoever. Not to mention eminent domain. You talk about uh, people who have their land uh, seized by the government. They're not going to be thrilled the same way farmers aren't thrilled right now with the uh, with the Trump administration when it comes to them well, not being are, able to find laborers. There are th thousands of acres in Texas, imminent domain. There have been, you know, lawsuits going left and yeah. right, b millions of dollars spent, and these people are not moving. So there's actually not land, enough land in order to cover the entire uh, perimeter of Texas. But that nonetheless, uh, Ali, I want to give you the final word as far as where we're going to be seeing immigration reform in 2018. I think the wall is really a symbolic gesture, actually both on the right and the left. They have both of their uh, symbolic reasons for not wanting it. I think if the Republicans and the Democrats can come together and find a way to tighten border security in a way that is fiscally responsible, in a way that is actually going to be able to uh, decrease illegal immigration, I think that we're going to be able to get along as well as find some kind of compromise on DACA. Uh, that's what we're going to need to do. All right. Ali Stuckey, Ben Kissel, thank you very much. Thank you. Kelly. Thank you. Overseas pro-government rallies held across Iran. Government supporters chanting slogans against Israel and the United States. That comes as anti-government protests continue across the country. More than 1,000 people have reportedly been arrested. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley saying the U.S. supports the demonstrators. The Iranian people will determine their own destiny. And let there be no doubt whatsoever. The United States stands unapologetically with those in Iran who seek freedom for themselves, prosperity for their families, and dignity for their nation. Kitty Logan joins us live now in London with the very latest. Kitty. Hi, Kelly. Well, this time it's the pro-government demonstrations which have brought thousands of people out onto the streets in Iranian towns and cities. The first protest today took place in the north of the country, but more soon appeared elsewhere. Now, Iranian state TV says they're in direct response to the days of demonstrations against the government. And just yesterday, the U.S., of course, called that meeting at the U.N. to address these protests to the anger of the Iranian government, that is. But the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, says the anti-government protests in Iran are a human rights issue which should be of international concern. And that's because at least 21 people have been killed since those anti-government protests began on December 28th last year. Now, people first took to the streets about the economy, but they soon directed their anger against the Iranian government that the Iranian leadership says they are inspired by foreign interference. But it's interesting to note that these protests now seem to be fading, and that's largely because of an Iranian government crackdown and that shutdown of social media. Kelly? All right, Kelly Logan, thank you. So the author of the discredited Trump dossier could be in big legal trouble. A new twist in the Russia investigation coming up next. But this all goes to how did this investigation into this collusion begin with law enforcement? What was Christopher Steele's role? Who was he working with in the, in the Justice Department or the FBI people? When you get to the point when you actually make a criminal referral, then you're saying to the Department of Justice, we have seen the information, we have seen the evidence, we believe there is more than a probable cause to prosecute this crime. And so that is a whole nother level. That's former Utah Congressman and Fox News contributor Jason Chaffetz. He's talking about the letter Republican Senators Chuck Grassley and Lindsey Graham have sent the Justice Department asking for a possible 
criminal investigation into the man behind the Trump dossier. Christopher Steele, a former British spy, intelligence officer, compiled the largely unverified dossier for the research firm Fusion GPS, which, by the way, was partially supported by the Clinton campaign. Joining me now is Byron York, chief political correspondent at the Washington Examiner and a Fox News contributor. Thanks for joining us, Byron. Good to see you. Hi, Kelly. So your article goes to the heart of the matter as to what people should anticipate from this move by Senators uh, Grassley and Graham. Explain. Well, it, the, the story has been a little bit confusing because we yes. don't know exactly what's going on because all we have is a short letter that the two senators sent to the Department of Justice and the FBI. It was a cover letter for a longer memorandum making a case. That was all classified, so we haven't seen it. Uh, but here's what uh, appears to happen. The two senators appear to be concerned about statements that Christopher Steele, the dossier author, uh, made uh, to the FBI in the summer of 2016. If you go back to then, he started compiling the dossier. He finds this kind of spectacular uh, allegations about Donald Trump, and he, he believes they're so important uh, that even though he's working for the Clinton campaign, he takes them to the FBI and says, hey, look, this is what I have. Mm -hmm. He had a previous relationship with the FBI because he had been in British intelligence, and they basically considered uh, hiring him, essentially, as a special operative to keep doing this investigation. But uh, what Grassley and Graham were concerned about was, at the same time that was happening, he was still working for the Clinton uh, campaign, and he was sharing the same stuff that he shared with the FBI. He was sharing it with reporters, trying to get that story into the press. So did he tell the FBI, hey, by the way, I'm also telling this stuff to reporters, uh, or not? And I think that is the question that is at the yeah. heart of this issue. Well, Byron, you explained it very well, and that would automatically conjure up conflict of interest. But let's go a little bit deeper. Let me, I'm actually looking, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm actually looking at the 18 uh, U.S. Code uh, 1001, and it says, uh, except as otherwise provided in this section, whoever in any matter within the, within the jurisdiction of the executive, legislative, or judicial branch of the government of the United States knowingly and willfully, one, falsifies, conceals, or covers up any trick, scheme, or device, a material fact, makes any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representative. And here's one that I think goes to the heart of your story makes or uses any false writing or document knowing the same to contain any materially false, fictitious or fraudulent statement or entry. Now, we're not saying that that's exactly what's going on, but that would appear to be what the two senators are focusing on and what your article talks about as well. Right. It appears that they're focusing on what it was that Steele told the FBI. It's not the question of whether the contents of the dossier were unsubstantiated, uh, which they still are. The, the major substantive allegations still are. It was not that. It was what he told uh, the FBI. And by the way, so really Under quickly, that, i, I got to yeah. let you go, but real quick, real quickly, uh, as you know, Senator Dianne Feinstein says this is uh, basically a distraction and a deflection. Yes. Yes, Democrats uh, have been very opposed to this. Uh, she is the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, which actually issued this letter. Uh, a lot of them have been condemning it. I think what we're going to have to see mm -hmm. 